So good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce you here to Georgia Tech and, and to this conference sponsored by Geotech and the Georgia Tech Research Institute. Um, as Danielle mentioned, I am the, the deputy director, sort of the chief operating officer of the Georgia Tech Research Institute, the applied research part of Georgia Tech here. Um, I'll admit to you up front, I'll sit in parts of this conference, but I know very little about geospatial information systems. Um, I have the opportunity not just to operate in the business that we have, but to teach and to do research here at Georgia Tech. And my research area is, is generally classified in the area of complex systems and systems engineering. That's what, what I teach. So I thought it would be useful sorry, um, to talk to you just a little bit about this concept of wicked problems um, and set the stage for this as the conference proceeds over the, over the next couple of days. Um, at GTRI, our, our kind of our branding, our logo is, is problem solved. And wicked problems are sort of classed as unsolvable problems, so why would we be talking about unsolvable problems? <laughs> so it's an interesting area to set the context. Um, I'll ask you as you go through the next couple of days to kind of clear off your inboxes, your to-do lists, and, and open your minds up. Um, Jim Collins, in his latest book, Great by Choice, he introduces the concept of zoom in, zoom out when you're trying to look at large problem concepts. So the idea that we need to be able to zoom out broadly around context of a problem and then be able to zoom in into the details and be able to do that rapidly to understand what's going on and what's the proper area for me to focus in, in, in the solution of a problem. So that's a, one of the natures of wicked problems. Um, I was actually driving down the road just the other day, listening on the radio to a, a debate. And the debate was about, if you're familiar, if you're from Atlanta, you'll know that on, at the end of July, we have to vote on a, a special local option sales tax for transportation. So we're going to tax ourselves over 10 years to improve transportation in the Atlanta area. And uh, you know, the big area of debate was around the project sets. So, you know, who is more in favor of transportation projects, like subways and light rail systems? Or who is more in favor of road projects, like expressways, express lanes and tollways and things like that? So I got to thinking here, this is a great context for a conference like this. How do you help these sort of problems? So how many of you out there would be in favor of light rail systems? Quite a few. How many of you would be in favor of, of express lanes? Just a few. How many of you would, be, would tell me to uh, set my alarm clock two hours ahead and quit taxing you? <laughs> that would be me. So <clears throat> there's many solutions uh, to problems here, and they're not obvious going in. So I thought that the kind of the keynote discussion, the lady at, at Department of Transportation summed it up in this discussion when she said, the end answer is, it depends on how you look at it. That is, by nature, what we deal with when we talk about this thing that we call wicked problems. So um, I'll define wicked problems for you. This is out of a class that we teach in leadership and decision making. Um, there's six characteristics of wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that you can't characterize up front. You can't understand the nature of the problem until you've defined a set of potential solutions to place it in a context. Wicked problems have no endpoints. There's no definitive problem, so there's no definitive solutions. Um, so if you can't solve them, what does that mean? Wicked problems are not right or wrong. They're only better or worse. So it's really important to understand that better or worse is a social context for a problem. It's not an engineering or scientific or physical context. And so you have to consider that uh, when you go forth. Every wicked problem is unique. Solutions will always be custom and define the fit the situation you're in. Um, every solution to a wicked problem is a trial operation and can have other consequences, some intended, some non-intended. Um, and finally, wicked problems can be characterized as, as a set of alternative solutions. There may be one solution, there may be many, but you can't know ahead of time. So there's no choices to compare. There's only uh, uh, potential opportunities. 
So I think an important thing here is, is to put this in the context of how we make things better, not necessarily how do we fix things. Um, so when we look at wicked problems and we go off and we address them, we understand that you have to address wicked problems first with leadership and decision making, not just with technologies. Um, you have to experiment to define hypothesis around what potential solutions might help out. And then you gotta prototype and pilot and iterate those solutions um, using similar but ideally simpler problems. So it's not just technologies that we focus on. Technologies can help. Um, so this whole area of traffic um, is a great example of a wicked problem in an area that we teach, in the area that I do research, which is complex adaptive systems. When you take these problems and you apply them to systems, they're usually complex adaptive systems. When I say complex adaptive systems, I mean systems that are composed of intelligent agents, usually humans, but not always, that learn and adapt over time. So their behavior shifts over time, and we are rapidly improving our ability to model things so we understand this context around um, complex systems, but we're not necessarily there yet. The tools are helping us, and, and tools that you'll talk about here are gonna help us in the end. So if I look at complex adaptive systems, I have this going in position that, that these are things that should be designed. You know, we don't want traffic to emerge all by itself. We wanna design traffic systems, and we want to control as best we can the behavior of those systems. So we manage the complexity by providing structure and simplification. So I always talk about this thing here, you know, this is a very complex system, but it's, it's been simplified greatly. Imagine if you had to take your smartphone and use the DOS command line prompt to talk to it, right? Some of you remember that. <laughs> um, so the idea of rules of order, rules of simplification, or what we need to engineer, technology sometimes simplifies, sometimes makes things more difficult. Um, complex systems are gov governed by leadership and experience, um, not simple control, and they're, and they're managed by monitoring and influencing the state of the system and the behavior in it. So the keys to influencing state are two things, they're information and influence as provided by leadership. And I think that's the real important context to this conference is, is what is the information and then how do I use it to influence people, influence people productively. Um, so these are kind of the essential factors. So will technology help? So one other little story, I was uh, driving with a colleague from Munich last fall over to Ramstein Air Force Base. And you know we're on the Autobahn and we're following our Nuvi and you know, never been there before, and uh, you know, there's this little in incident symbol sitting up there, and, and old Nuvi, she just kept routing us off to these side streets. So we'd get off the highway, and we'd go into a little town, and traffic was backed up for two or three miles, going to the little town, and, and so we'd turn around, got back on the highway, did this three times, and finally threw up my hands and I said, let's just go. Let's just take what comes to us and go. So we never hit an incident. And I just got to thinking in this case that, you know, the technology's great, but I, we had no context of the local environment to understand what's a smart path to take and what the other people are gonna be doing. If I was here in Atlanta, I would know. I would always know immediately whether I should get off the highway or not, depending on where the incident was and, and what the other people are doing. Um, so in this case, I mean, technology's great, but without the appropriate social context, you know, is it gonna be usable or not? We have to learn those things. So, um, so I'm gonna leave you after this welcome with kind of a challenge for the next three days, three points. And the first point is, is this zoom in, zoom out, think broadly, what are the problems that are there to be solved? Not what are the solutions, but what are the problems that are there to be solved? Um, the second thing is how do I use influence and information? So I kind of look at this as the lock and key. And, and so the, the lock or the deadbolt is the influence that we use on people. The key is what turns the deadbolt, the information set. So how can I use information? And then the third thing is to uh, consider problems and solutions in harmony with the social context of what you do. Always harmonious solutions. 
So with that, I thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy the next few days here in Atlanta, um, and uh, welcome to the conference.